Viewers like you make this program possible. Support your local PBS station. This episode is about the flavors and experiences of Chef Chang's past. We have all types of genre of, of a ramen. How they influence his present. And a whole bunch of don't worry about it. It has it right here. Inspire him. It hits that magical spot. Motivate. And when it's summertime, it's all I want to eat. And sometimes annoy the hell out of him. We're going to keep on hitting until we get a nice one. Oh. Enter the mind of a chef. I see where my ball went. Events of the past can sometimes be a hindrance. I don't know what's hot anymore. Food trends change, you know? But oftentimes, past experiences are sources for inspiration and passion, drive and conviction. Either way, our present is a collection of these experiences and make us who we are. These are a few of David Chang's. <laughs> Before Chang made his name in New York, he found his calling working here in Tokyo, Japan. Somewhere from here to where that blue building is, right. down there, it was the homeless shelter that I lived in. Chang's pal Peter Meehan joins him on a trip down memory lane in the neighborhood where he cut his teeth in the world of ramen noodles. I would come here a lot, this neighborhood. What's strange is this is all like, that's a curry house, but this is like a Chinese ramen shop. So like we have all types of genre of, of a ramen and then mapo tofu ramen, and obviously this is the jahan. So what did you do in this neighborhood? Did you ever hit up the, uh, the pachinko I never Oasis? played pachinko, but I had no money. It's gamble. It's so loud. You want to see it out loud? <laughs> Ready? <laughs> I don't understand it. How can that possibly be appealing on any level? Japan, the land of many vices. <laughs> I'm beating you 21 to 10. Eat it. <laughs> Has your ability to eat ramen declined over I the years? I can't eat anymore. And now I feel like I'm going to die. Death by ramen? I mean, it's, it's kind of a distinguished way to go. Yeah. This is where I used to come. This is the same location, so I'm freaking out a little bit. So when you lived here, this was like the hot ramen? Yeah, I, it was a line. There's like the Chinese style. Right. There's the chicken broth, chio style. There's miso. Just like barbecue, you know, like right. mustard, vinegar, all the styles. And at the time, this was like the cool new thing. So what was it about the style of this place? And it was the first one to really sort of introduce like the heavy seafood element in the broth. I thought it was delicious. So came in omori, ramen omori. The double dip method. That was a revolutionary technique in the world of ramen. What's the double dip method? One dip, two tares. One was fish, one was soy. The double yeah. dip. The double dip. Ah. I had never had flavors like that before. And at the time, this was like the cool new thing. And I knew, though, as delicious as it was, I didn't think it would fly in America. I have no intention of waiting for you to get your girl. Go, go. Am I going to burn myself on this? You have to. So hot. Mm. You have to burn, <laughs> and you have to leave here sweating. It's super delicious.
Why is your broth so much different than my broth? That's not the same broth, though. No, it's a little bit more vinegar. It's a little more tart. So you can tell it's tasting. It's a little bit more intense. Yeah, totally. Wow. It's like soba. Yep. how it works in this family, isn't it? I'm sorry I'm not talking. <laughs> Should have figured out a way to make a living from eating noodles instead of cooking them. It's not about digesting. <laughs> it's just about eating. It's about tasting it. Awesome. Yeah. So should we go get more? Like I don't want to go next door. Come <laughs> arigato. Arigato. Chang has had much success in life but some plans don't work out as intended. Growing up in Virginia, Northern Virginia, I'd invite some friends that didn't grow up on kimchi to a Western kid, a round eye. It smells like something rotten. It has a very unique odor, but it's an acquired taste. Uh, it's spicy, it's funky, it's garlicky. It's got a lot of things that you're not normally accustomed to eating. This is a pechu kimchi, which is traditionally made with Napa cabbage. So basically, we take Napa cabbage, salt it, cure it, and then we add a bunch of uh, spice mix, garlic, salted shrimp, and we just basically let it rot. The fermentation process is all about preserving this, this beautiful cabbage that was harvested at the peak of summer and something that we're gonna be able to eat in the darkest of winter. You can eat kimchi fresh, and you can take it to the point where it's so fermented, it's like drinking a soda. I was doing an event a few years back. We were garnishing oysters with uh, kimchi because we had to serve like 400 people. Let's just put it in the, <laughs> in the food processor. This is what came out of it. I kept on looking at it, and Joaquin Baca, who was my partner back then, who now owns Brooklyn Star, I was like, Kino, you know, he's, he's Mexican. What do you think this looks like? And he's like, salsa. I was like, yeah, dude. And it tastes like salsa. Because of this, when I was thinking of salsa, I was like, let's open a restaurant that just serves burritos, Korean burritos. Uh, it sounded like Kevin Costner and Feel the Dreams. We're going to change the world with this Korean burrito. We're going to call it the sound. Almost all the ingredients you put in a burrito, we have a parallel, at least in Korean culture. I was like, well, obviously we're gonna have hoisin sauce. And then we have rice. You got your beans, pickled cucumbers, and what we have here is pork butt. It's carnitas, right? So, but before I put the pork, I'm gonna forget the one of the most important ingredients that I learned about making burritos was the aluminum foil. I, I, I thought, Korean and Mexican was gonna take over the world. This just still kills me. I put the kimchi puree on, again, because whenever you go to a burrito bar, the last thing they put on is a salsa. I was just trying to get people to eat kimchi. I think it was because I had made fun of so much about how kimchi smelled as a kid. I wanted to make sure that it was in every American household, and um, I failed. It's really good. There are some things in life that should never change. We're here at Edward Lee's joint, 610 Magnolia. Thank Cheers, you for man. having us. Cheers, man. But we also have Julian Van Winkle here and Sean Brock. And if you could show us how to make the recipe for one of the most spectacular drinks I had the past year. This is the only drink I can make besides bourbon on the rocks. <laughs> Here we go. Orange is very important, and you want to trim it to the right size. Perfect, and take a little raw sugar cube, and this is orange bitters. Orange bitters is really the secret to this thing. Uh, just a few drops, and as you can see, what the napkin is doing is soaking up the excess, so you get just the right amount in the cube. Here we go. 
bar spoon, very important. Why can we not do it without that spoon? Um, but this is just the right size, because what you don't want to do is muddle the pith of the orange peel. Because as you know, a pith is very bitter. So you muddle just the fruit of the orange, and you can hear that good crunch. And this takes time. It's a five or eight minute cocktail. It's a great show if you're at a bar and people will be mesmerized. You take a few ice cubes. A good, clear, cold ice cube is better because it doesn't melt as fast. This is our 15 year Pappy Van Winkle. <laughs> you always want to smell the cork because bourbon can get corked just like wine and it will absolutely ruin it. Put just a splash in there to kind of wet things down. For some reason, right at 15 years, it just, the nuances of a, of a perfect bourbon, it really does. It hits that magical spot. Yeah. So you kind of build it, add a little more ice, a little more bourbon in there, it does dissolve the ice. Did you ever envision your bourbon ever being made in an old fashioned? Not really. I'm a purist. Yeah. My grandfather was a purist, my dad was a purist, but he did like a good Manhattan, so we're not adverse to putting our bourbon in a cocktail. Uh, the better the bourbon, the better the cocktail. And uh, you can see the color's looking really good in that. It's kind of fogged up very nicely. It smells amazing. Oh, I can smell it from here. How long is it going to be for the second one? <laughs> <laughs> and the third one. But why is that so good? It's something so simple, very but simple. takes a lot of love and a decade and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Julian, you're the man. Cheers to you guys. Yep, good job. But be careful, because it is 170. I know, twist. that's why I think it's a genius. <laughs> and now for some memories of summers in Virginia, blue crab style. The earliest memory I have is I asked for a blue crab party when I was five years old. We don't go to the Bay Area and go blue crab fishing. You can do it with a chicken drum stick, just sit in the water, and there's, these crabs would just bite onto it, and you would bring it back up. Everyone knows, again, how to eat crab cakes, all that stuff, but no one really knows how to eat crab itself or cook crab, and it's very simple. I'm gonna show you the three staples for what I think you need. You don't have to get any, anything fancier than this. Blue crabs, beer, and Old Bay, probably the greatest seasoning America's ever produced. Celery salt, spices, and a whole bunch of don't worry about it. It has it right here. Get a pot going. I find that American beer works really well. When I say American beer, <laughs> I'm saying stuff that is not a microbrew. So about four beers with, a, I don't know, a handful of Old Bay. Throw these guys in. You want your shellfish live and kicking, looking like they're pissed that they're out of their environment. Dead shellfish is not a good thing. These guys are still kicking, but they're not trying to escape what their inevitable fate. It's very important that you're cooking them alive. So when you get in about halfway, you want to cover it in some Old Bay. And put the rest in. Put some more Old Bay on top. It seems like we're using a lot of Old Bay, and we are, but we're trying to season the meat, season the inside. So I'm just going to stir them up so they cook evenly. Cook them for about eight minutes, not even. Now, I'd much rather eat blue crab than lobster. Everyone loves lobster. I'm not hating on lobster, but, but I love blue crab more. It's just, I think, underrated. So the crabs are, are pretty much cooked through. You're looking for, obviously, to turn red. These are small guys, and if they were larger, we'd, I'd probably cook them in, in, uh, in, in batches. And this is how I actually like to eat it. Get a bunch, and then, like an assembly line, just motor, motor through. This is how you open up a crab. You take this thing that I can't ever remember what it's called. Break it in half. When you're breaking them in half like this, you have the back fin. And the back fin is traditionally where you get most of the meat. This is your lump crab meat. And I always pretend that it's almost like a lollipop, that you just got to you gotta just peel the shell around on the back end, and that's your crab. Delicious.
whether you do it at a restaurant or you do it on the dock with your friend, for me at least, it's one of the few things in life that truly gives me pleasure is eating blue crabs uh, in the summertime. Dave Chang is a golfer, or was a golfer, and one time destined, it was said, to be a champion. He essentially retired as a competitor at age 13. Still, it's a factor in figuring out the man. Thanks for having me at Callaway. Yeah, thanks for coming in. We'll, uh, we'll have some fun today. We'll get you dialed in. Cool. Get you into a new set of clubs. We'll show you uh, what we do for a club fitting. It's been a long time. What we have is uh, all of our latest and greatest in terms of technology. We'll start with irons, we'll fit you there, and then get into the woods and driver. Okay. Okay. This is our Callaway performance analysis system. It's the same exact system our tour pros use to get fit on. Okay, what you need to do is set the golf balls up right on top of the silver dot. And then after you hit a shot, what we'll do is we'll look on this screen and see exactly what the shot would have looked like if we were outside. Look at this, right out of the gate. Beautiful. Great swing. Your head speed at 94 miles per hour, that's well above tour average. Okay, that's a lot of club head speed. And somehow, I mean, I feel this is, in my head, I can relate this to cooking, but if you have an entire generation of people working on high technology golf clubs, does that make them less of a player than, say, Ben Hogan's era when they're hitting all off forge and the sweet spot? was probably like the size of a, a dot, a right, small it's, dot. It, and this is what, probably the size of a quarter on this one. Right. And so much technology now is coming into the culinary world right. um, where cooks may not have to be as talented or work as hard because technology is allowing them to be better cooks than they normally might be. Right. The main thing that, that we want, or that I want for golfers to come in here is, is for the game to be more enjoyable. That, that is a foreign concept to me. Right. <laughs> Oh, where'd that land? It's only about 20 years of rust. <laughs> it has been several years since Chang has swung a club. In fact, the last time he played, the entire set of golf clubs ended up in the pond. I see where my ball went. Oh, All right, we're gonna keep on hitting until we get a nice one. I think this outfit's too handsome for me. I don't, you guys, I don't think I can play in He's got to live up to the outfit. I don't think I can play in such an outfit. Boom. There you go. We go home. <laughs> Cheers, Dan. Wonderful, wonderful round of playing golf, the handsome, handsome boy style. It's all, it's all positive, but at the same time, you know, you got to work on the, um, you know, the matching the the sweater with the, the pants. You gotta so, coordinate. You, you gotta look good to play good, you know? <laughs> One of the weird things about golf uh, is what you eat on the golf course. There seems to be hot dogs uh, in America, but in Korea, eating naengmyeon, mul naengmyeon, which is uh, this chilled pickle broth uh, noodles, and you eat that before your turn on the back nine, and when it's summertime, it's all I want to eat. It's literally all I think about eating, because that's what I ate as a kid with my dad. So we play golf, either go to a restaurant that served naengmyeon, or you know my mom would make it. And it's North Korean by origin. This is a variation of how my mom would make it and it's made out of buckwheat. They're very hard wheat. They're gonna take a long time to cook. Buckwheat grows in abundance in North Korea. I'd love to show you photos of the buckwheat fields, but uh, <laughs> there are no photos of that stuff. So we made a broth out of uh, brisket. I've never made a broth out of brisket for naengmyeon. In fact, this is the first time I've ever made mul naengmyeon before. It's all sort of from memory of me watching my mom make this stuff. You never see naengmyeon with a ribeye or a porterhouse or, uh, or really expensive cuts of beef. They're usually off cuts, but that broth is usually relatively weak, so you augment that with the pickle juice from the kimchi. 
you add Seven Up or Sprite to your pickling liquid, and it has effervescence, which is what you want anyway when it's properly uh, fermented kimchi. It sounds crazy, but it's not that crazy. We're gonna add this pickling juice. This is quite concentrated. I'm gonna add uh, 16 ounces of Sprite, and it was probably about uh, six ounces of uh, pickling liquid from the white kimchi. So that, for the most part, is the nengmyeon broth. So I'm gonna check on these noodles real quick. Nengmyeon, in the summertime, you wanna keep cold, so I'm just gonna keep these on ice. While they cool down, I'm gonna finish the rest of the dish. So here we have the beef broth. We have some top round, and we just cooked it through. So it's not really a beef broth, it's just the, the water and that we cooked the beef in. We have um, an Asian pear. So we're gonna start assembling this dish now. Take some of these noodles. As you can see, they're extraordinarily long. I'd order nengmyeon with my dad, and they'd always ask you if you would like your noodles cut. My dad would take huge offense, and if someone tried to cut his noodles, he would be pissed. So they do that because you can die, literally die, because the they just don't end and they're so chewy, you can't bite through the noodles. Anyway, put in the, the broth on top, some of the brisket, slice, some of the Asian pear, just a small tangle of the white kimchi. So we put a soft boiled egg instead of a hard boiled egg, just because that's just personal preference. I didn't skim it as much as it should be because I, I want some fat in there because I believe there's flavor in fat, but that is my version of Moon Engen, reminded by all my childhood memories of playing golf. So weirdly, I made Moon Engen. What is it that leads a person to become a chef? I think it was because I got made fun of so much about how kimchi smelled as a kid. I wanted to make sure that it was in every American household. Is it a random act? It's like Dance Dance Revolution, but with these crazy drums. Or does a certain combination of events need to happen to a person before he decides to settle in the heat oh. of the kitchen? You got to coordinate. The bug bit Chang at some point, and the world of food is probably the better for it.